Colossians chapter 4, we're wrapping up the this book today. And um, it's been one of the uh, one of the short ones, four chapters, like like the one before it, uh, Philippians. Philippians, four chapters, right? Um, so anyway, chapter four of Colossians, the most Christocentric book uh, in the in the Bible, uh, all about Jesus, uh, what He's done for us, and then uh, some of our response because of what He's done. But the, but the whole thing centers on on Him. Uh, and the first part was really focused on what Christ has done for us. And the second part, verses or chapters one and two, the second part, chapters three and four, because of what He's done, how we now respond. But this, the focus is is Him, not us, um, and what He has accomplished. So because of what He's done, verse four, masters provide for uh, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you have a master in heaven. And again, we've talked about this before, that we ought not think in terms of masters and slaves in, in, term, in, in biblically in New Testament is in the same terms as we think of American slavery and the atrocities of that. These are simply those who have authority over another. And so more appropriately translating it into our vernacular um, employers and employees, employers provide your employees with what is right and fair. Um, treat them with dignity, treat them with respect. Um, it's all right to demand that they work hard as long as you pay well <laughs> uh, and fairly. Uh, and, and, and the reason Paul says this to, uh, to those in authority is because remember, you got someone in authority over you. And so we ought not rule with a heavy hand because there could be a very heavy hand over us um, and and so he's reminding people be fair and generous to those who are under you because you have someone over you uh, you know we, we humanity uh, part of our problem has been that we have lived our lives and run our governments as if we're answerable to no one uh, and Paul says there is a God, he is alive, and he is over you. And so we ought to walk uh, with great wisdom and discernment and discretion because of the one who is over us. We are not islands unto ourselves. We, we are answerable, and there is the one who is over us, namely Christ. So be fair and generous to those who are under you because you are under him. Uh, verse 2 through 6, in my opinion, is really the meat of uh, Colossians 4. And there's a lot there. Um, d d verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. I'm going to get into verses 3, 4, 5, and 6. Because those are really, as I look at it, I see kind of the big heading, speak your faith, live your faith, and then speak God's love. But it's set up with verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. When Paul uses that word devote, he means literally continue in prayer. Um, be devoted to prayer, be con consistent and constant in prayer. Uh, being watchful and thankful in prayer. Give attention. Being watchful means to give attention to it, um, to be active in it. So give attention and be active with thanksgiving to prayer, to your devotion and your consistency in prayer. And then about prayer... Paul says the, these three things. Speak your faith, live your faith, and speak God's love. He says it like this in verse 3 and part of verse 4, and four, 3 and 4. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains, 
Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. So he's saying, um, give attention and be active in your continued devotion to prayer with thanksgiving. And when you're praying, pray for us that God may open a door for our message. Now, where was Paul when he was writing this? He was in prison. And we would understand it if he said, pray that God would open a door because I'm in jail. It's not what he says. He does say, pray that God will open a door, but not to the jail so he can get out. That would be my prayer. That would be your prayer. What he says is, pray that God may open a door, uh, not to leave, but to witness. Uh, Paul's in jail. Um, and he says, pray that God will open a door. It's not that. I'm not asking you to pray so I can get out. I'm asking you to pray so I can witness. Open a door for my witness. Uh, when he says, open a door for our message, he means literally our words. The, the word used is logos, the word. Uh, and he's, he's praying that a door would be open so he could speak the word of God, not just live a lifestyle and people would see God, that actually that doors would be open, that I would be able to speak this message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. Again, speak, though, so that I can speak it. I want opportunities to talk to people. And he's saying, pray that doors will be open while I'm in jail, that I'll be able to talk to people, not just live differently. I'm actually able to proclaim it and speak it, the mystery of Christ, for which I'm in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. I, I hope you understand that Paul's witness was not only lifestyle evangelism. It's not that he only lived differently and people saw the way he lived and wanted to get to know Jesus that way. Not it, it, His was a vocal witness. And everything that Paul talks about in Scripture, every, every time he talks about the witness of the gospel, the witness of in evangelism, he talks about it in, in in terms that that necessitate speaking it, like not just living a good life so people will see the difference. And I think it was I think it was Saint Francis of Assisi who said, "Preach the word always, and when necessary, use words." And and I think a lot of people have grabbed onto that either out of ignorance because they don't know how, enough of the Bible to. Speak they don't feel like they know enough of, of Scripture to speak it. They don't have a their, their own, a, a, a true, profound relationship with Christ to be able to know Him well enough to talk about Him. Or they're just cowards, and they just don't want to speak it. I understand what Assisi was saying. Like, live different. Let your life reflect the life and lifestyle of Christ. I understand that. Um, but... Uh, Unfortunately, most people have grabbed onto that idea and said, I don't need to speak it, I just need to live it. As if living it is, you know, Trump's speaking it. And, and Paul doesn't say that. Everything that Paul says is about speaking the gospel, speaking your faith. Um, always give a reason for the hope that you have. And so Paul's prayer is, 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 is yeah, pray. And one of the things you can pray for me is I got an open door to speak this mystery of Christ. So speak your faith. And then he does talk about the lifestyle in verse 5. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. So speak your faith and then live your faith. So it's not that you have one without the other. You have both of them hand in hand. But you can't only have one. So speak it, absolutely, and live it. Don't just live it. Speak it and live it. Be wise in the way you act um, towards outsiders. The way you act, what he literally means there is, is the way you make your way among them. Be wise in the way you make your way among the out, those outside the church. Be wise and like we're living in this world surrounded by people who don't have relationships with us. So as you make your way through the labyrinth of life, uh, in and out of people's lives, doing business and 
and, and commerce and education and just life. Like as you maneuver through these lives that you come in contact with, your oikos, your huddle, be wise. Make the most of every opportunity. To make the most means literally to redeem it, buy it back. Like uh, the opportunities have been sold, have been given over to the evil one. And if we're not wise about it, those opportunities will just pass us by. So he says, be wise as you make your way through the labyrinth of these relationships with people, these interactions with people who don't know Jesus, and redeem these opportunities, buy them back, make the most of every opportunity. Uh, that word opportunity is the Greek word for time. That means It's kairos. It means these ordained times and seasons. There will be these ordained times and seasons as we make our way through the labyrinth of humanity that God orchestrates and puts together. They're not coincidence. They're, they're divinely put together by a supreme almighty God so that we can have interactions with people as we go through their lives, living and speaking to make the mystery known of Christ known to them. And then he says, let your conversation, so now he goes back to speaking again, not just living, and then he goes back to speaking. Um, let your conversation, let your speech, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone um okay so let's unpack this let your conversation be always full of grace so he's he's, he's talking about our words not just our lifestyle he said let, let what comes out of your mouth be always full of grace seasoned with salt now this is interesting that word seasoned means not just sprinkled it means a purposeful, thoughtful arrangement. So let the words that come out of your mouth, your conversation, be purposeful and thoughtful and let the words be arranged with salt. In this instance, this word salt means literally let it be interesting and engaging. So let your conversation with outsiders especially be a rain of the words that you use be purposeful thoughtful and arranged so that this mystery of Christ is interesting and engaging I think it was Howard Hendricks who once said it's a sin to bore people with the gospel this would back that up let your conversation Think about the words used. Think about how they're put together. How to, how they're put together. Make them purposeful, so that your speech, especially among those who are not part of the church, is interesting and engaging. So your life is interesting. Don't be a bump on a log. So that you may know how to answer everyone. When, when Paul says so that you may know how to answer everyone, so that you may be certain. That's what that word know means. You may know, you may be certain how to answer. Now, I understand a lot of people are um, hesitant to speak uh, um, their faith and witness because they don't know what to say. I've heard that so many times. Paul says, well, there's a way you can know what to say. Let, let your speech be thought, I mean, think about it, be purposeful about it, arrange your words so that it's interesting and engaging, so that you may know how to answer, so that you can be certain how to answer. I'm, I'm going to tell you how to be certain of what to say in every scenario. Here it is. If your words are purposeful and arranged with grace, you can be certain that that is the correct response. If, if, if you choose your words in conversations with people about Christ, about the kingdom, the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of Christ, and you choose words in those conversations that are purposeful and thoughtful, um, that, that are purposed with grace, that are thoughtful about grace, you can be certain that that's the correct response. How do you respond to people? You respond to people with a whole bunch of grace. That's the whole meat of, not the whole, but that's the, that, that's the real meat of chapter 4 as far as I'm concerned. And then Paul gets into this 
section of telling people thank you and giving directions to people. And there's some interesting stuff here. We can draw some lessons out from this. He says in verse 7, Tychicus, uh, Ty Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. This is, so, this is what you look for in people that are, you know, your right-hand people in the church. He's a, he's a dear brother, so there, there's a relationship there. Not, not like a physical brother, but like a real, a real connection. He's a faithful minister and a fellow servant. That word minister is diakonos, which means literally servant. So this guy is, is um, th th this is one of those guys that, that he's one of the ones that say, you know, I'll bury a body for you. Like, I'm with you in this. He was, he was like the armor bearer for Jonathan. and um, Like, I'm, I'm there with you in it. And Paul says, verse 8, I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know uh, about our circumstances and that he may encourage your heart. So he says, this guy, he's a dear brother. We've got this great relationship. He's a faithful minister. He's a servant. And I'm sending him to you for this one purpose. Well, for actually two purposes, that you will know what's going on and that he may encourage your hearts. Um, that word encourage has the root word to it as paraclete, which is one of the references or names of the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, which means the comforter. And so he says, that this, I'm sending him to you so that you may be comforted, not just with news, but I think it's really a such a, that you may be comforted with the Holy Spirit. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who was one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. Now, I really think you need to, at some point when we're done with this study, on your own, you need to study the book of Philemon. Because Philemon is where we learn about Onesimus. Uh, the book of Philemon, it's a very short uh, little letter. It's 25 verses long. The entire book's 25 verses long. And what happened, um, apparently, is that there was this guy named um, Onesimus who was a slave to Philemon. And Onesimus ran away uh, and he got arrested put in jail and when he was in jail he met Paul apparently and came to faith and now he's out of jail and Paul writes Philemon this little note um, and he says basically I want you to set Onesimus free I want you to clear him of all his debts I want you to uh, if if he stole something from you I, I want you to write him a, a um, I want you to, to, to write him a certificate of freedom. And, and Paul says, I could be bold enough and order you to do so because you owe me your life. Whether he's talking just spiritually or physically, he, like he owed Paul a debt. And Paul says, I could command you to do this. And yet I, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to do it on the basis of love. Um, I'm an old man. Um... And Onesimus has been has been uh, a help to me. He said, and, and Paul says in verse eleven of Philemon, formerly Onesimus was useless to you, but he's become useful to both you and me now. He said, I'm sending him back to you. He says, look, he did you dirty in the past, um, but now he's part of the family of God. He's a help to me, and I'm sending him back to you. Um, he says, I, I don't want to do it without your consent. Because um, I don't want to force you to set him free. Um, but, but I'm sending him back to you because I want you to clear him, and I want you to allow him to help me in the ministry. Interesting thing in Philemon verse 15, he says, Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. He says, Things don't happen by coincidence, Paul says. There's a reason for it. The reason why he was separate from you in jail with me, so you could have him back now, not as a slave, but as a brother. So there was this issue that happened, and 
and and Onesimus was a slave and he was in prison and and now he's come to faith and I'm gonna send him back to you not as your slave anymore you need to set him free because now you get him back as your brother uh, and then he says um, I want you to welcome him like you'd welcome me and if there's anything on his account charge it to me I'll assume the debt which this is exactly what Jesus has done for us Jesus has told us you welcome each other like you welcome me you treat each other like you treat me and if someone has something if, if someone owes you something just says charge it to me and Jesus uh, was all of our stuff that was owed was charged to Christ um, so anyway, like that's that. This is the anesthesis he's talking about, and I would strongly encourage you to read the book of Philemon and, and jump into that. It's you know, twenty some verses long. You can handle that study. It would be very, very good for you. Um, and then verse ten, my fellow partner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Um, the fact that Paul includes Mark now. Uh, in this letter in Colossians, this letter to the Colossian church, um, th this speaks volumes about reconciliation. Because if you remember, back on one of the missionary journeys, uh, Mark bailed on him. <coughs> He's the nephew of Barnabas. And uh, Mark, or, or, sorry, Paul and Barnabas finished their missionary journey. They're getting ready for the next one. And Barnabas wants to take Mark. And Paul's like, heck no, we're not taking him. He bailed on us last time. He doesn't deserve to be on 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 this trip with us and so caused such a huge split between paul and barnabas that they each went their separate ways and barnabas went and got mark and it's so interesting that because they split up twice as much ground was covered i mean god used even this rift between them uh, for his glory uh and, and and now mark and paul are are put back together and reconciled it's just beautiful verse 11 Jesus, who is called Justice, so one is his uh, Jewish name and one of his Greek is his Greek name. Jesus called Justice, well, just like Saul and Paul. Saul was, um, you know, the the Israel the Hebrew name, and Paul was the his changed name, Greek name. Um, uh, Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved comfort to me. So apparently, through all this ministry that Paul's done, there were five Jews that were standing with him. That's it. Um, that, that gives me a little bit of hope, because sometimes it seems as though after all the work uh, that you do on behalf of so many people, there's only a few who really stand with you. Um, and so these are, he said, these are the five Jews with me. Then verse 12, he says, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. Uh, he is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Uh, this guy, Epaphras, apparently was the pastor in Colossae. Um, and he said, he's always wrestling in prayer for you. Uh, that word wrestle means literally to labor as in childbirth. Like he is laboring for you um, in prayer. There's effort and energy and 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 the energy going into his prayer for his people that they will stand firm in all the will of God, that they'll be mature and assured. Uh, verse 13, I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, this is the only place in, I think it's the only place in Scripture where we're actually given Luke's profession. That's how we know Luke was the doctor. Luke, the one who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Luke, the doctor. Um, and Demas, send greetings. It's uh, A lot of people think that Luke traveled with Paul because Paul was so sick so often. Um, and it's interesting that the man who healed so many um, bore infirmities himself. Um uh, you know, and again, I just I I'll go back to Jesus and the one who healed our infirmities bore our sickness. Um, and so a lot of people say that's why Luke traveled with Paul so much because Paul was so sick and he needed he needed care. And uh, if that's true, one it just speaks to uh, to Luke's buy-in of the God, of of the kingdom. Like he's he's 
He is not sitting back in his private practice somewhere. He's on the front lines of ministry and mission, taking care of the, those who are doing the ministry and the mission. Um, and then uh, it tells me that Paul's a freaking bad dude, man, to to be ill all the time and still out on the front lines and not taking all these sabbaticals and vacations. And he's just he's just grinding it out. Um, just amazing. And then it mentions this guy, and Demas, in greetings. This guy, Demas, is an interesting fellow. Well, let me just let me finish this first. Uh, verse 15, Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to uh, Nympha and the church in her house. Um, after this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read to the church of the Laodiceans and that you, in turn, read the letter from Laodicea. We don't have any idea what that letter is. It's lost in history. Uh, but let me jump back to this guy, Demas. Demas is mentioned three times in the Bible. Um, Philemon, verse 24, mentions him as a fellow laborer. And then Colossians 4.14 mentions him as simply, he sends greetings. And then 2 Timothy 4.9, uh, it said that he has forsaken us. And it's this real interesting um, spiral that Demas starts well. He's a fellow laborer. He starts strong. And then time goes by, and he just simply sends his greetings. He becomes a little bit lazy, not so on fire. And then ultimately, at the end of it, he's forsaken us. In other words, he's he loves the world. See, it's it, one of the things we learn is that you don't stay neutral, you don't stay in the same place. Um, and so let it be a warning that we can start strong, but it really matters how we finish as well. Um, but 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 here's how this wraps up. Verse seventeen, tell Archibus, and quote. See to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. He said, just, just, just stay faithful. Whatever it is you're called to, just stay faithful. Epaphras was just called to pastor that little church in, in Colossus. Just stay faithful. Archippus, what, what, whatever you, what, whatever the Lord has work, the Lord has received, given you, whatever you've received from the Lord to do, just be faithful in it. Big or small doesn't matter. Your faithfulness is what matters. Just keep at it. Don't be like Demas. Don't start strong, get lazy, fall away. Just stay faithful in the work God's called you to do. Um, and then verse 18. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. And he ends it like he does everything. Grace be with you. Grace of God, the unmerited and unfavor. Uh, undeserved favor of God. The unmerited and undeserved favor of God be with you. At the end of the day, I'm, I'm going to try to be faithful. I'm going to take that charge, complete the work. And I'm going to just ask that God's grace be on me. And let that be enough. So, that's Colossians chapter 4. Bless you as you read it. Turn over to Philemon and get familiar with that and the truths that are in that book, uh, that little letter. Um, and as Paul said to his, grace be with you.